Hello and welcome to Video Revealed. I'm Col I'm Colin Smith and we We're going to have a look at what is Cinema 4D and how you can use it. Cinema 4D is a 3D application where you can work with real 3D objects. It integrates directly with Adobe After Effects. You can bring in Photoshop files. You can do a ton of things with it. I use it all the time when I have to work with 3D objects. Now, I'm not going to take you through exactly how to use it. I'm going to show you what it is. Two great sites to go, Grayscale Gorilla and the Pixelab.net. Great places for you to get in-depth knowledge. Now, there are four different versions of Cinema 4D. Actually, there's five if you count the free one that comes with After Effects. There's a light version that helps you integrate with After Effects and drop in models. It's really limited beyond that beyond just integrating models, its rendering is also limited, but it's great for some quick 3D. There's a prime version, which is the uh, first version, and it's easy to use, but it is missing quite a few features the other ones have. Visualize is a great solution for architects and designers who want to visualize 3D objects in their work. Broadcast is for 3D motion graphics, and the top one is Studio, which is everything you need. Studio includes everything. I'm going to show you dynamics and uh, how that works. I mean, it it's so much fun. But let me caution you. If you think Premiere Pro is complicated, and you think After Effects is really, really hard, well, Cinema 4D, I find, is the easiest of all the 3D applications, but it's still incredibly complex and it is very render intensive. I'm gonna show you one render that took me 16 hours because I had to render 200,000 objects. Um, but it is really, really powerful. I'm gonna take you through from the simplest stuff and then I'll show you lots of examples. Let's dig in. All right, this is what Cinema 4D looks like. It looks nothing like a typical Adobe application. It has one view window here, the viewport, some tools along the top, on the bottom, and lots of settings that get filled up on the right. There's a very simple timeline down at the bottom, but if you want a more advanced timeline, you can either go to the window menu and choose timeline, or just like Adobe applications, there are workspaces, so if you choose animate, it completely redefines it and puts the timeline in the focus at the bottom. I'm going to go back to standard, which is where uh, I work most of the time. Now, there are tools over here for creating objects. If you click and hold, you'll see some simple ones from cubes, cones, spheres, and there's even a simple figure in here. I'll choose the cube and drop it in the scene. You'll also see this grid. Now, Navigating in any kind of creative application is a critical part. If you're in Photoshop, you're constantly panning and zooming. If you're in Premiere Pro, you're, you're zooming in on the, on the timeline and zooming out. Well, 3D, it's essential. A little bit of history. 3D started in the Unix world, and Unix computers had three button mice. This is long before um, uh, scroll wheels. So you can get an $8 mouse, that has a, a scroll wheel that's also a third button. If you add the Alt key on Windows, the Option key on Mac, and a three button mouse, you can pan and zoom and dolly in and rotate everywhere. So I am going to hold the Alt key down and I'm clicking with my mouse and I'm rotating around. I'm now clicking with the middle mouse and panning around, clicking with the right button and dollying in or, or dolly in or out. Uh, also, these tools are up here. I just find them a pain to use, so you have to go up to here. There's also this button that takes you to multiple views. Clicking once with the middle button mouse takes you to these views, and you can make these views anything you want. By default, the, this one is the perspective and it's shaded. The rest are not. 
this is right, that's front, that's top. It helps when you're trying to align things. So if I'm trying to align, align it on the bottom of the plane, you can't really see that here, but you sure can see it there. The same shortcuts work in any of these windows here. So I'm holding down the Alt key and moving this around. Now you're not gonna be spinning around. If you accidentally hit the um, um, rotate around, which you'll do, hold the shift key and it'll snap back. All right, so what can you do with a cube? Well, a cube is one of the primitive objects in here. And it, although it does have some capabilities, it needs to be converted to a polygon to do a lot with this. We can also break this up in segments. So if I change this to four, it's broken up into segments. You can't see it until we change the display type. So if we add lines to our shading, now you'll see the lines. We can't grab these lines until we convert it into polygons. Now, I'll show you in a sec how these tools can affect this even as a primitive cube. But if you click over here or press the C key, you'll now convert this into polygons. There's no getting back, so it's polygons now, and you can't make it a primitive. And you can see the icon has changed to show you that. Well, what you can do with this is you can now select points, you can select lines, and you can select faces. And so now I'm taking a simple cube and I'm modeling a new surface instead of having to try to draw this from scratch. And the most efficient way to work in any 3D object is to create stuff with primitives, uh, like cubes and spheres, and, and then manipulate those. I'll put a link uh, in the description to a great tutorial on that. All right, let, let's add a cube, a cone, and a sphere in together in one scene. And these little indicators that you see will help you move things around in your 3D scene. You can see they're colored red, green, and blue. You can see the coordinates down on the bottom left. So if I drag on the blue, I'm dragging only in that coordinate. If I drag the red, I'm dragging in that coordinate. If we add a plane to this, so we've got a floor, we can line this up. Now you can see that the plane is cutting off the sphere. And there are four different views. You can get to them with this button here, or if I click the middle mouse button, I can bring that view up. And in this right-hand view, you can clearly see that the floor is right in the middle. So we'll drag that down in the bottom. So we now have a floor and we can either click and drag in here or in the top view, we can use this to help us position that floor. So that's why this multi-view is so important in 3D. So now we've got these three objects. I'll go back to my main view. And let's create a bit of a scene. I'm gonna turn off my grid. And to define these a little bit better, we'll add materials. Now, each version of Cinema 4D comes with different presets. So this is in the wood preset. I'll drag a wood on this one. You can see it adds the wood and it also adds the material down in the bottom. All right, let's go for metal. And I'll drag some car paint to our sphere and a gold surface over here. And the last one is, let's look for some tile. And I'll drag that to our floor. All right. So now we've got this scene. And if we render this, we can click on this button here or hit Control R 
on Windows Command on our Mac and it renders the scene. So we've got more natural looking materials, but we're really missing any real uh, shadows and, and things of that sort. So for that, we'll add a light. And you can add a target light, spotlights, sunlight. You can add an infinite light, area light. We're gonna add a spotlight. And again, we're gonna jump to our four up view because we can see over here, the light is not in the right location. So from the top view, we can move the light into the right place. It's not facing directly on our objects. So and you can see here, it's facing forward. So we're going to do a little bit of animation with our light. So I'll move ahead in my scene here, make sure the light's selected and click on add keyframe, move ahead a little bit more. And instead of the move tool, I'll grab the rotate tool, which is the R key. And if I rotate this light down, you can see that we get a light. Set another keyframe, go back to the beginning, hit play, and you'll see the light will move. Now the animation is showing on here because that's the one in the front. I'll go back to this one and you'll see it show up. Now the lights are built for efficiency, so the shadows are turned off. Let's just drag this wider. The shadows are turned off, so if we click on the light, go to general, and, oops, go to, yes, uh, shadows, and we'll change this to soft. Now when we render this, we'll see the shadows. We can take this up a step by taking the fall off to inverse square, which is more physically accurate. You can see the light falls off instead of being absolutely perfect. So that's our light and our scene. And we can even add a physical sky to this, which is kind of crazy because it's, it's not really outside. And we can load these sky presets. And again, depending on uh, the version that you have, um, you will or won't get presets. So now we've got this giant sky and you can see it takes much longer to render. Now this is rendering a single frame. So you can easily see why it takes so long to render some of these scenes. Now you can see that the sky is taking over what the shadows are doing. It's much, much brighter. And here are some examples of the physical sky that really are quite amazing, including things like volumetric um, clouds. You can also set a time and location. So there could be a city that you're going to. So let's go to Nigeria. So in, in, on that particular day, at that particular time, that was the recorded, wow, you can, see, <laughs> you can see how bright it was in Nigeria in March 2005. All right, let's go back to our cube and show you another thing that's important when you're working with the versions. I want to show you some of the things you get in uh, Studio and Visualize and, and the MoGraph menu really is powerful. So as an example, we've got our shape here. Let's go back and make this wood again. All right, and this is a primitive and I'm going to change the fillet on here and you can see when I do that, it changes the roundness of the edge. Okay, so that's cool. If you hold the control key on Windows Command on Mac and we duplicate this multiple times, now we've got multiple copies on here. But if later on you wanted to change the fillet amount, you would have to do it for every single object. Now that's not a lot of work with four or five objects, but what if you had hundreds 
or maybe even thousands of objects. So one of the advantages to other versions is something like the cloner. So this is going to clone things. So if I put the cube in the cloner, and we go to the cloner and get rid of that, and we start to change that. So that's our offset in the Z location. So you can see there's a bunch of cubes. If we go back to our first one and change the fillet amount, you can see it's changing on each one of these. So cloning is one of the, the most typical operations that people will use in creating things. It's not just linear um, and it's not just radial. It can go in a lot of different directions. And then you can turn these into actual physical objects too. So the clone can build real polygonal objects for you. So here again, we've got all of these objects, go back to our cube and we change the fillet amount or change the, uh, change the material and it all updates that easily. Okay, so let's go look at the next menu, which has these splines. And so there's a pen tool, there's Boolean operations and some presets. I'm just gonna to go to the pen tool and I'll go to the front view here and I'll draw something that should look fairly familiar once you see it. So just clicking once and moving the mouse and then I'll join the final point up here. So now I've got this shape and I'll, I'll use some of these tools to change the shape. If you're familiar with a wood or metal lathe, then you'll know what this is. There's sweeping, extruding. This is great for type, lofts, bezier. We're gonna warp this shape. So I'll choose the lathe shape. I'll make sure that this is set to zero or else weird things can happen. Now I'll drag the, sp the spline into the lathe and you'll see my martini glass. And if we select the shape, you can see it's still live. So I can change this shape around. Now it, it's not very smooth. So I can add another one of these, which is the subdivision surface and take the lathe into the subdivision surface. And we can go to the subdivision surface settings and change this value and smooth this out. Now, whoops. Now, when we go back to our spline and edit this, now I'm, I've got a lamp. Now I've got a weird cone thing here. So all of these shapes are editable and much easier to create and more dynamic than if you tried to model these with just separate objects. So there's our very weird shape, whatever it is. Let me show you another uh, quick manipulation. Let me drag this up. And this time I'm going to choose, I'm gonna go all the way over to this one where we can modify by things like bending, twisting, melting, shearing, taper. I'm gonna choose bend. And by default, again, it does nothing. Now with bend, we need to put it inside the cube. So now I'll click that in the cube. You'll notice the shape does not correspond to this tall shape. So I'm going to go back to my multiple views here. And if you look at the bend, there's the cube. There's the bend. It's way over there. So I wanna make sure that it's inside that shape. And I wanna make sure that it is taller. So I'm 
just going over to the size and clicking, making it taller. I want it to be all the way. So that shape fits in. So again, that's another great reason to have four up view. You'll find this all the time. You think you just line tune things up this way. And when you look at it on the side, you realize that they're so far away. So jumping in here makes sense. So let me go back into here. If we click on the bend, there's a strength set at zero. And watch what happens when I move this around. And your first thought might be, well, it's not bending enough. So if we go back to the cube, right now it's set on one segment here. If I change this to two, it's now going to bend. If I keep adding segments and turn this all the way up, now we get a smooth bend. So if I go back to bend and change this, you can see I can bend that all the way around. So again, that's the efficiency settings. All right. Now, if you go back to the bend and we change the size, so instead of the size going all the way up, the size was just partially bending. So it's only on that little piece. Go back to the cube, we turn that up. Go back to the bend. If we move this bend around, you'll see the bend is going to bend that piece. If we rotate that, now we're gonna rotate that bend if we move that, it's going to bend and rotate at the same time. So instead of having to model something like this, very odd shape, it's based on a cube and it has a, a modifier on it. And this you'll find all the all everywhere. You know where I used it? Let me open this up and show you. Does that look familiar? It's the set behind me. And you'll notice that it, it's, it's not a straight line. It actually rotates around. If we zoom out, we zoom out and have a look, you'll see the set is bent. And I've got a few other things turned on here. Let me turn that off. And you'll see the bend right here. And the strength is set at 75. So you can see there's my set. So if I set that at zero, that's what I modeled. Just a bunch of shapes like that. And then I bent them around. The lights and the screen were added later so that they wouldn't be distorted as it bent around. I also added these. They don't show up as well here, but um, you know, add in the comments if you think you know where this shape of tile, what famous movie this tile came from. All right. Now let me show you one thing that I really love, and that's working with dynamics. So I'll create a cone. I'll create a plane. And we can explore materials over here in the contents. So I'll look for silk. I'll put the silk on here. And let's look for stone. And I'll put the artificial stone on here. So as it stands right now, if I push play, nothing's happening. So I'm going to select the cone in the tags, simulation, collider, body. So the, the cone is now going to collide with something that has another dynamic tag. So let's select the plane, simulation tags, and make it a soft body. Raise it up a little bit. Now when I push play, it's going to fall on top of this. And we can move the camera while this is going on. 
And you can see it's tearing in here and we could change that. So this is being calculated um, by Cinema 4D. It allows me to change things like gravity, friction, um, viscosity, air, the friction on the silk, the friction on the cone. Um, we could add another object below this. So if we, instead of having it um, with that, and again, does that look like it's right above the cone? Is it? See, it's not. Now it's above the cone. Let's turn this one into a soft body and see what happens. Oh. And if we increase the animation, so instead of 90, let's go to 200. Watch what happens. Is it gonna stay on there? Oh, it will. So it's sticking on there. So let's move it over a bit and now find out what happens. Oh, there it is. And it will fall infinitely all the way down there unless we make a floor You can also pull on these handles and we have a floor that's a collider. Now it's going to fall off there and hit the floor and the floor has friction on it so it stops. <laughs> you can lose you can lose yourself in playing around with these dynamics. It is so much fun. Let me show you a few examples. This is a fan blowing a cloth. And it doesn't look very realistic. That's because we're in this preview mode. And if we render this out, then you'll see now it looks like cloth. But it's absolutely Incredible that this is done all dynamically. There's an example of balls hitting that flag and the flag actually tearing. Pretty cool. Another dynamic example. Ball is coming in and destroying that Here's a great one, soft body. You can see it going through and being distorted by that shape. Now in my older show, I had a show opening where I had a living room. <clears throat> that might look familiar. This living room here. Let me just speed this up. So we fly over the couch, down behind the cushions, and up and over. And if we zoom out of this, so if I turn the camera off and zoom out, then you can see there's my little scene right there. All right, another place I used it was when I needed to create a 3D dojo. This was the dojo that I used and I brought in green screen footage in the front and that would be the background. 
So there's no way I could have uh, created the accuracy of this, the perspective of this in any other program. A 3D program was so much easier. And this was a, a, a free model that I imported and I just removed any elements uh, that were in the background that I didn't need. And one of my biggest projects that I worked on was this 3D quarry. Let me just turn off my grid here for a second. And this quarry was created and exported out as a VR project. So you could wear VR goggles and you could experience the size of this quarry because people didn't know the size of this quarry because they would look at it on a piece of paper and it's deeper than Niagara Falls or it's going to be deeper if they build it which we don't want them to build it. And the only way to get people to experience this would be to go to the quarry before it's built. So I took the uh, vector drawings from the plans and I extruded a hole out of the, uh, the um, uh, a plane. So just created a plane and popped that down. And then I created these walls in here and then put for size reference, these trucks and a guy over here standing on the surface. There he is. So when you go to the quarry floor and you're looking, let me render this, you're down here on the quarry floor, you can see what it looks like. Now you'll notice that this is equi-rectangular. So this is the output that would go to, to look at with VR goggles. I literally, because um, I've got the Oculus Rift, but I also have a, a Samsung um, Galaxy S8 and I stick this in my um, VR goggles. I, I literally just take this either a single frame or a video out, put it in here and I can view this. Um, the newest version of Cinema 4D actually has VR working environments, so you could be viewing in, in VR and um, editing and manipulating in VR. I was going out to this, but this would allow someone to experience going in person, on location, and standing there in the, in the floor and looking around. And I'll put a link to this. And then I did um, explode one wall over here, it's not in this uh, version, but over on this wall here, um, away from the crane, I blew this wall up and I blew it up before um, Cinema 4D added um, great tools to, to blow things up with the Voronoi um, fracture. Um, but in this example here, you'll see that's the wall blowing up. The dust particles were exported out on a completely different pass um, because I, I needed to figure out how to do that. And that took me a while, but that was the thing that took 16 hours to render um, to be able to, to see that. Now, I'll, I'll just show you very quickly the Voronoi fracture will make the floor a collider body. And now let's grab the sh shape. And this MoGraph menu will be one of the menus you will not see a lot of these features in the free version that comes with After Effects. But here's the Voronoi fracture object. So the Voronoi fracture is not in the cube yet. We need to put the cube into the Voronoi fracture and you can see it gives us this view here. And we go to the Voronoi fracture and then we add a rigid body to this. So when we play this back, it breaks apart. And if we go back to the Voronoi fracture, there's lots of ways of uh, setting up this object. Or you can set 
how things fracture. So how many points? So if we turn this way up, now we'll get smaller points. With the newest update, you can change the texture on the front and the, the, the parts that get broken, which would be very natural, uh, where one side that's been exposed to nature and then this other side hasn't been, or just a different kind of uh, internal structure is a different shape. And you can add lots of organics on there to make it look incredibly real. You can also add uh, motion blur, uh, depth of field, many things inside um, Cinema 4D to make it look accurate. So this Cinema 4D will take you from simple uh, shapes all the way up to Hollywood style um, motion graphics. There's a 3D camera tracker and solver in here. Uh, lots of, of great ways to work. The last thing I'll show you are the render settings. So if you click here to render out, um, you can render this out in almost any size. I've rendered something uh, in, you know, 8K to go out. It took, took a while, but you can set that up. Uh, here's one thing that will screw you up. All frames, if you are exporting out an animation, export out all frames. There's lots of ways to, to uh, change the renderer. There are also uh, many third-party renderers, and a lot of the professional 3D guys will not render in here. They want more uh, photorealistic stuff. Everything I've done has been rendered right within Cinema 4D. So anytime I need to create an accurate three-dimensional um, thing, and sometimes it's a uh, background object. One time it was a sink. So if you look here, I needed a sink and I needed a tap for this talking character, um, which I'll do a future tutorial on that. Instead of you know starting from scratch, I created those things directly in Cinema 4D. It way quicker than if I had to use Photoshop or, or Illustrator or anything like that. I think there's a great benefit in learning some level of 3D, um, get ready for a giant learning curve. If you think video editing is complex, uh, 3D editing is way more complex. Uh, my friends will know on, on Facebook that that's where I will go for help all the time. And sometimes it's as silly as not turning on um, shadows for lights. Oh, and by the way, there's tons of lights in here. There's even uh, studios that are, already have soft boxes that you can drop in. So again, this is not how to use Cinema 4D. This is an introduction of how I use it and where why would it be important for someone like yourself to dig into it, you can, you've got a, a free version. If you've got a Creative Cloud account and you've got After Effects, then you already have Cinema 4D Lite. It's missing a lot of the, the cool dynamics and motion graphic uh, stuff, but uh, it is a, a pretty good integrator. All right, so there you go. There's a whole bunch of links in the description to take you to Grayscale Gorilla and the Pixel Lab. Pixel Lab, like I said, you can sign up and get a ton of, of uh, free things that are amazing i mean they're really really there's that and that fly is 3d of course hopefully anyway if you're new to video reveal and you found this informative take a moment and subscribe you want to support us some more you can do that um with paypal we've got a link on this in the description and on the front of the channel you can donate one time or donate monthly if you want to be notified uh, by our for our if you want to be notified of our weekly uh, tutorials, then you got to ring the bell down to the bottom to be notified. All right, till next time, I'm Colin Smith and I'm losing my mind here uh, in Cinema 4D. Not another one. Uh, because you can just have so much fun in Cinema 4D.